Hello, my name is Allison Ewing, and this is my presentation for Ingreza, also known as Valbenazine. So, first of all, we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about. Oh, that's, there we go. So, we're going to talk about some Ingreza facts, the mode of action, adverse effects, dosing adjustments based on hepatic or renal failure, patient education, cost, required testing, and contraindications, followed by pregnancy and breastfeeding. So first of all, we're going to talk about Ingress's classification. It is the central monoamine depleting agent, and it's in the vesicular monoamine transporter 2 family. So this centrally depletes dopamine storage in presynaptic vessels. So reuptake mechanisms use different presynaptic transporters, but the same vesicular transporter is used for all three monoamine neurons. So the presynaptic transporters are serotonin, S-E-R-T, nor norepinephrine, N-E-T, and dopamine, D-A-T, but all go to the same vesicular transporters. So the actual mechanism of action is unknown, but they reversibly mediate and inhibit these BMAT2 uh, sensors. So uses and dosing. It's approved for tardive dyskinesia. It came on the market in 2017, so there's not a whole lot of research. And it shows promise for dystonia, but it hasn't been approved yet. It is not approved for children. Dosing starts at 40 milligrams daily, and after one week, it is increased to 80 milligrams daily. And this picture is an old textbook example of tardive dyskinesia, and you can see some of the abnormal involuntary movements that these people are experiencing. So pharmacokinetics, it's metabolized through hydrolysis to form metabolites via the CYP3A4 and 5 enzymes. Bioavailability is 49%. It has greater than 99% protein binding in plasma proteins. Half-life is 15 to 22 hours, and excretion occurs 60% in urine, 30% in feces. Peak is 0 0.5 to 1 hour, while the active metabolites are 4 to 8 hours. As we discussed before, it decreases the availability of monoamine neurotransmitters by preventing their storage in synaptic vessels for pharmacodynamic. Next, what patients and clinicians need to know about Ingressa. So first of all, our side effects. Common side effects are CNS effects, drowsiness, fatigue, sedation, and abnormal gait. These all occur about 10% of the time. Dizziness, issues with equilibrium, falls, and echocytia are anywhere from 3 to 4% of the time. Um, elevated glucose and weight gain are reported in between 1 to 2% of patient populations. Vomiting is reported in about 3% of patient populations, and arthralgia and dyskinesia are about 1 to 2%. Respiratory tract infection also occurs about 1% of the time. So warnings and precautions. It may cause CNS depression. Um, the patients need to know that they can be sedated. They need to carefully go about their daily activities until they know how ingressa will affect them. They also need to know that it may cause or increase depression and or suicidal ideation. A lot of patients are taking this along with antipsychotics, so this should definitely be monitored more closely with them. And patients who are prone to QT prolongation need to be monitored. And some patients who are on Clozaril uh, also need further monitoring it when they take Ingressa in conjunction with the Clozaril. It needs to be used in caution with patients who have moderate or severe hepatic impairment. They don't recommend any dosing changes for this population. They just state use with, with caution and monitor more closely. And do not use in patients who have severe renal impairment. Excuse me, impairment. It should not be used in people who are poor metabolizers of the CYP2D6 enzyme. And it's not recommended for use in pregnant or breastfeeding women. Initially, animal testing showed some fetal abnormalities. They have not tested it on breastfeeding women. It has not been tested on pregnant women. 
So the company is just saying do not use it in pregnant or breastfeeding women. If a mother needs to use it and is breastfeeding, they ask that she stop breastfeeding or that she ceases the drug five days before breastfeeding her child to make certain it's out of the system. Contraindications include hypersensitivity to any component of the medication, and monitoring includes a baseline abnormal involuntary movement scale and a baseline EKG, as well as follow-up AIMS testing and EKGs. Now, in my facility, we also do um, complete blood counts and metabolic panels in conjunction with this medication, but it's not recommended in the literature. So drug interactions. I hit the major ones on, in the little black boxes. PYP 2D6 inhibitors may increase serum concentration, so that population needs to be monitored, and in some cases, they ask that you not use it concurrently. CYP3A4 inducers, if they have moderate inducing effect, they can monitor um, concurrent use. If they have strong inducing effect, then they ask that you avoid concurrent use. It can increase the serum levels of digoxin, so increased monitoring is required there. And MAOIs may increase the adverse or toxic effects of the drug, and so they recommend that they not be used together. Also with St. John's wort, it may decrease the serum concentration of the ingreza, so it avoiding uh, concurrent use. Tetrabenazine is another VMA2 inhibitor, and they should not be used concurrently. So points to consider for Angreza. Is it effective and is it accessible to the general population? So in the initial approval study given to the FDA, the AIMS difference in phase two in those treated with 40 milligrams of Angreza was a decrease of 1.9 points in their AIMS. With 80 milligram um, subjects, it was a decrease of 3.2. However, in phase three, only 61% part, uh, of participants completed the full third phase of the study. It was 48 weeks, 121 people completed it. They could not get accurate AIMS assessment, um, accounting for placebo, so they implemented patient global impression of change. So these are self-reported change impressions, and they were clinically insignificant, and they actually were not published because they didn't um, complement the drug very much. Now we have a patient who has a severe movement disorder, so bad that when this person would get a soda, um, it would shake up and then blow up everywhere because this person could not stay steady. It has helped quite a bit in conjunction with botulism injections and with this person's Clausrel and other um, medications. So it is somewhat effective for this person, but this is in an institution. And the other thing I'm concerned about is affordability and accessibility. Only about 30% of Medicare plans cover Angreza. And as you can see, the average retail cost is $7,285.89 a month. So if my patient ever gets out, they will not qualify for this assistant program, assistance program through the manufacturer because they will have government insurance, like Medicaid or Medicare, and they will not be able to pay out of pocket. So does my person stay in the facility so they get the medication, or do they go out and deal with their severe movement disorder? Schnooks is a local um, grocery company. I think they have about 30 grocery stores that's run by a local family. So they're the cheapest in the area at $5,892.12 a month without insurance, while Walmart was the highest with $6,250.06 per month. So you're averaging anywhere from $196 to $242 a day, and it's hitting about $70,000 a year. Okay, that is everything I have for now. Thank you so much for your attention. And rather than put a reference slide on, I am just attaching them to my presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Thank you.